Okay, Sergeant, please start your recordings. Oh. Uh -huh. oh, Sergeant, please start your recordings. You see recording done. Cloud done. Okay, Sergeant Lugo, you may begin with your opening statement, please. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Miller, we are ready to begin. Thank you so much, Sergeant Lugo. It is great to see everyone here this morning. Forgive the uh, technical mistake that uh, has everyone now uh, in the hearing remotely as opposed to uh, in person. So I thank everyone for joining. Uh, good morning and welcome to today's legislative hearing. I'm Council Member Ajanik Miller. I'm the chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. Today we will be hearing two pieces of legislation, intro 2452 of which I'm the chief sponsor and intro 2325 at the request of the mayor. Beginning with 2354, 20, 20, this bill would amend the New York City's collective bargaining law to allow non-members to proceed through the grievance and arbitration process without union representation, so long as non-member assumes the cost. The bill would account for the Supreme Court decisions in Janice versus AFSCME, which declared that unions could no longer collect mandatory share fees so to cover the cost of collective bargaining. In the aftermath of the court's decision, union leadership feared that more public workers would withdraw from the unions, magnif withdraw from unions, magnifying the free riders effect, where employees can reap the benefits of union bargaining without supporting them financially. The aim of 2454 is to help ameliorate the free rider effect by removing specific services and benefits that the public sector unions are required to provide to non-union members. This will reduce the union's obligations and financial strain, ultimately preserving the viability of, of our union's valuable public sector um, services. Turn, turning to intro 2325, this bill will provide job protection for restaurant, food service workers, airport workers displaced during COVID-19 pandemic. Also known as the right to recall, as food service airport employees reopen post pandemic and employees would be required to first offer a previously laid off worker their job back before hiring another applicant. Often economic downturns force employees to cut costs, causing older and more experienced workers to be, to, to be terminated and replaced with younger, cheaper labor. It's imperative to protect workers across these essential industries so that they are not undermined, undermined and exploited. The pandemic has only reinforced the importance of job, income, and security for the city's essential workers. I look forward to hearing the feedback from the administration, the city's unions, and concerned advocates about today's legislation. I'd like to thank my, my staff for putting this together. Uh, special advisor, great Joe Gold, Joe Goldblum, Ali Vasulinjad, legislative uh, director John Wani, and of course council staff, uh, Council Bianca Vital, uh, Elizabeth Arts, and Nevin Singh. I'd also like to thank the members that have joined us this, this this morning: Council Members Adams, Moya, Rosenthal, Drum, Denowitz. Lewis, uh, and I, I guess we have them all. 
Uh, so I thank you. And with that, we can begin our hearing. Uh, today's testimony uh, from the administration. Uh, if, 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 uh, Bianca, if you can swear them in, it would be swell. Sure. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. My name is Bianca Vitali, and I am counsel to the Committee on Civil Service and Labor for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panelist to give testimony will be representatives from the administration followed by council member questions, and then members of the public will testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Benjamin Holt, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Consumer and Worker, Worker Protections, Office of Labor Policy Standards. Stephen Starr, Deputy Director and General Counsel of the New York City Office of Collective Bargaining. Additionally, the following members of the admin will also be available for answering questions after testimony is provided. Stephen Atanian, Executive Director for Ex External Affairs at the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. Before I begin, before we begin, I will administer the oath. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Deputy Commissioner Holt? I do. Deputy Director Stephen Starr? I do. Executive Director Tani? I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Holt, you may begin when ready. Thank you very much. Good morning, Chair Miller and members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. My name is Benjamin Holt, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection's Office of Labor Policy and Standards. I am joined today by my colleague, Stephen Etanani, DCWP's Executive Director for External Affairs. DCWP protects consumers and workers through enforcement of key consumer protection and workplace laws. These include New York City's paid safe and sick leave law, fair work week laws, protections for freelance workers under the Freelances and Free Act, and recently passed legislation for third-party food delivery workers. Our agency advocates for new policies, investigates complaints, conducts proactive investigations, and recovers restitution for workers. As Mayor de Blasio said earlier this summer, a recovery for all of us means New York City moves closer and closer to fully reopening our economy restoring job, the jobs we lost and ensuring equality in, in our comeback. DCWP promotes the city's recovery by facilitating the reopening of businesses and addressing the severe economic impact the pandemic had and continues to have upon hundreds of thousands of working New Yorkers. As the economic impact of the pandemic came into focus and as businesses began reopening last summer, DCWP advocated for policy and legislation to support businesses and workers alike. We prioritized giving small businesses the tools they needed for compliance, worked with the council to cut burdensome regulations for businesses, and have saved businesses millions of dollars through 33,000 cure eligible violations. We also refunded more than $12 million to restaurants participating in the city sidewalk cafe program to alleviate business costs and keep workers employed. That together with the Department of Transportation's successful open restaurants program has saved more than 100,000 restaurant jobs. We also took steps during the pandemic in partnership with the council to enact needed protections to support fast food, hotel and food delivery workers. Fast food workers now cannot be arbitrarily fired from their jobs and have a right to reclaim their former jobs. Hotel workers must be retained for 90 days when a hotel is transferred or sold and longtime employees are entitled to up to 30 week severance pay if they are laid off during the pandemic. And third party food delivery workers have key new protections, giving them more control over their work and a right to minimum pay. 
Most recently, DCW, DCWP partnered with the City Council to pass legislation that provides additional paid leave time to more than 3 million private sector employees to get a child or dependent vaccinated. That legislation will support the small business community by ensuring our city's collective public health. The more we can minimize the effects of the pandemic, the more children will be able to avoid school closures, the more workers will be able to go into work, and the more businesses will benefit from a return to normalcy. Whether in promoting increased business activity or by standing up protections that provide workers with stable jobs and stable paychecks, the administration and city council have been steadfast in supporting businesses and workers. And our message has been clear, we are all in this recovery together. Turning now to today's introduction 2325, right to recall. Introduction 2325 continues the city's efforts to support an economic recovery for all. It provides laid off workers in airports, event centers and caterers with a right to recall when their former jobs are once again available. These industries represent tens of thousands of workers in New York City, and it is a critical step to the city's economic recovery that we support their ability to return to work. While businesses like retail stores started more fully reopening and hiring as early as June of 2020, workers in airports and event centers are only now seeing increased opportunities to return to work. Airlines and airports, despite being deemed essential businesses, have endured reduced economic activity due to consumer hesitancy to travel and fluctuations in the public health situation. As a result, many workers who work in airports, including in food and beverage establishments and other customer facing services, were laid off without knowing when they, could, when they would return to work. In the case of event centers, these venues were shuttered completely to the public in March of 2020 and only began reopening this past April. That meant the working people supporting concessions and other operations for event venues were still losing opportunities for work almost a year after many other industries were permitted to reopen. Airport and event center workers, many of whom are low-wage workers and people of color, were laid off through no fault of their own. As these sectors reopen more fully, we need to ensure that they have the, an opportunity to go back to those jobs that were interrupted by the pandemic. These individuals are qualified, trained, and experienced workers eager to join the city's economic recovery. Ensuring these workers' right to recall is a key tool to promote a strong recovery for their communities and for the city. DCWP's partnership with the City Council is critical to delivering protections for workers. Introduction 2325 promotes economic stability that is needed to combat the ongoing and lingering impacts of the pandemic. We urge this legislation's immediate passage. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Deputy Director Starr, you may begin when ready. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Miller and members of the C Civil Service and Labor Committee. My name is Stephen Starr, and I'm the Deputy Director and General Counsel of the New York City Office of Collective Bargaining which I'll refer to as OCB. OCB is the impartial non-mayoral administrative agency charged with administering and enforcing the provisions of the New York City Collective Bargaining Law, the NYCCBL. The board is a neutral tripartite body made up of two city representatives appointed by the mayor, two labor representatives appointed by the municipal labor unions, and three impartial members who are elected by a unanimous vote of the city and labor members. The NYCC bill itself was drafted by a tripartite commission and enacted simultaneously with the Taylor Law in 1967. The amendments you are considering today in proposed bill 2454 were developed in that same tradition. As a collaboration between our office, the Mayor's Office of Labor Relations, and the Municipal Labor Committee. I am here to speak in support of the proposed bill and to inform the Council of the agency's view of the importance of the proposed changes in the Council that the Council is considering. The primary statutory functions of OCB are to certify employee organizations, adjudicate improper practice petitions, and administer the grievance arbitration procedures that are found in the collective bargaining agreements that exist between the city and most of the municipal unions. The NYCCBL contains a statement of policy which 
declares it to be the policy of the city to favor and encourage the right of municipal employees to organize and be represented, to enter into written collective bargaining agreements, to utilize impartial and independent, independent tribunals to assist in resolving impasses and contract negotiations, and to utilize final and partial arbitration of grievances between municipal agencies and certified employee organizations. It has long been recognized that the right to collective bargaining is essential to sound and stable labor relations, which benefits the city, its employees, and the public. An essential part of the NYCCBL provided for the payment of dues or fees to employee organizations. These funds are used for the bargaining, enforcement, and administration of collective bargaining agreements and other member benefits. Unions have a duty to a fair representation with respect to its members and non-members covered by their agreements. Until recently, employees that did not become members of an employee organization would pay agency fees instead of dues to cover the cost of that representation. In 2018, the Supreme Court prohibited agency fees for public employees in the significant case Janus v. AFSCME. As a result, public employee unions retain the statutory duty of fair representation for non-members but could no longer collect agency fees to offset the costs. In 2018, in, in anticipation of the Janus decision, New York State amended the Taylor Law to account for the elimination of agency fees and to balance that against the union's duty of fair representation. These amendments, among other, other things, limit a union's obligation to represent non-members to the negotiation and enforcement of the terms of a collective bargaining agreement, allows a union to decline to represent non-members when being questioned by an employer in statutory or administrative proceedings or in grievance or arbitration matters concerning evaluation or discipline provided the non-member is permitted to proceed on their own and allows a union to provide legal, economic, or job-related services or benefits beyond those provided in the collective bargaining agreement to only its members. The NYCCB is a local law, and, accordance with the, and in accordance with the Taylor Law, it must be substantially equivalent to the Taylor Law. For this reason, the proposed amendments to 12-306B1 and B3 reflect the amendments to the Taylor Law that limit a union's obligations to represent non-members and provides that if a union does so in accordance with the law, it does not violate its duty of fair representation nor interferes with, restrains, or coerces public employees in exercising their rights under the NYCCBL. Unlike the Taylor Law, the NYCCBL has a number of provisions regarding grievance and arbitration procedures. The proposed amendments are necessary to provide unions with the authority to allow non-members to proceed to arbitration on their own at their own expense. It also ensures that where an employee does pursue a grievance or arbitration on their own, the union may participate in those proceedings to protect its interests and those of its members. I will be pleased to answer any questions that the members of the committee may have about the proposed changes to the NYCCBL and look forward to working with the council to pass this legislation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Miller followed by council member questions. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you, Chair Miller, please begin. Thank you again, Councillor. Um, so uh, on 2325, uh, as the workforce uh, begins to return to work and we've seen some of uh, uh, some, some, some folks that, that have had difficulty in the desire to return to work, have we found um, right to work and similar legislation uh, locally uh, and, and nationally as, uh, a viable tool in securing uh, job security and the return to work? Thank you for that question, Chair Miller. Um, you know, with respect to what's happening nationally on uh, right to recall legislation, we are aware that there are models from other states where similar laws have been passed. 
Um, to this point, we have not had direct conversations with those jurisdictions about their experience. Um, though I will say that we are not aware of any adverse or unintended impacts coming out of that legislation. Um, so we do think that right to recall um, can be an effective tool. Uh, and obviously, um, this is a mayoral priority and something that we think can, you know, serve as an important step for workers in these targeted industries that are covered by introduction 2325. Okay, um, in your testimony, uh earlier um you, you spoke specifically uh about the tools resources and the support that the city had and the administration had given to uh small businesses and and other employees throughout the city um that support has it willfully translated into support for workers or do we find right to recall necessary legislation in order for to for uh, workers to be uh, returned to work uh, in a just manner? So we have throughout the pandemic continued obviously to enforce existing workplace laws in New York City. Um, the administration also has had the opportunity to work together with council to pass several new laws uh, to protect both essential workers and other vulnerable workers who have been hit very hard by the pandemic. Uh, just to, to list some examples of that, um, we have passed protections for displaced uh, hotel service workers to ensure a transitional employment period of 90 days when a hotel is uh, sold or transferred to a new owner. Um, we have together uh, worked on and passed just cause protections for fast food workers. Um, again, essential workers in New York City to ensure that they are protected from our arbitrary firings. Uh, we have also worked together on a hotel worker severance law for certain hotel workers um, to ensure that tenured hotel workers um, can have a stable income in the form of severance up to and until they do have a chance to be recalled back to their former jobs. So, so are you saying that these are industries that may or may not have been defined in terms of, 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 of a just return to work uh, for, for their employees that, that they uh, tend to lean towards a younger, uh, less expensive uh, workforce as opposed to the more traditional and experienced or those who just quite frankly have taken the fruits of, of the, the city's uh, resources and, and, and use it as a benefit and not necessarily uh, put into the workforce uh, as intended. What I would say in response to that, Chair Miller, is that these are examples of steps that we have taken together to protect workers during the pandemic. Um, we think a right to recall bill here is important because our city's recovery has to work for everyone. The way that this has been put together is to try and balance the needs of workers to get back to work um, with employers who are staffing back up. We don't think that those have to be at odds. We think there are benefits to businesses to bringing back trained, experienced workers who have done those jobs before. And really as a matter of fairness and a matter of equity, we believe that workers who lost their jobs through no fault of their own either young workers, older workers, longer tenured workers, unionized or not, if they were displaced because of the pandemic, we believe they should have an opportunity to go back to their jobs when those jobs are back up and running again. And, and, and for those opponents of, of, uh, of, of 2325 uh, state that, that this creates uh, uh, operational burdens and, and uh, uh, and hardships for them, uh, how do we respond? We are, as I, as I said, when, you know, in working on this legislation, we have tried to balance um, the operational realities of employers uh, with creating meaningful protections for workers. Um, the industries that are covered by introduction 2325 will tend to have a higher concentration of larger employers who we do think uh, will have the resources and existing infrastructure to be able to effectively implement and operationalize these protections. You know, notably, I would also say that 
this bill will not impose any new monetary costs on covered employers. Um, there is not a new benefit that needs to be funded and paid for here. Um, this is really about creating a process for workers to get back onto their jobs. And again, we think in the long run that will lead to great benefits for these employers. They will be getting trained, qualified workers back into jobs that they've done before without having to go out and find and train new workers. Um, so we think in, in the long run, uh, this is good policy for our city. Um, and this is going to create a just recovery that will have benefits for all sides. Okay. Um, uh, does any of the members have any questions? I don't see any hands raised. Uh, does anyone have a question for the panel on uh, 2325 or, or, or uh, 2454 as well? Chair, I'm gonna do the like, um, just give the little overview because um, council members, um, if you have questions uh, for the panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, if you would like to ask a question and you have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please do so now. Uh, council members, please, please keep your questions to five minutes. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. You should begin once I have called on you and the Sergeant has announced that you may begin. Let's just give a few seconds to see if any um, of the committee members um, have questions. Good morning, Council Member Orridge. We, we have been joined by Council Member Orridge, my good friend. Uh, how are you, sir? Do you have a question? Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, no questions here, but it's always good to see you. Uh, it's always good to be in the room with my friend from the uh, south end of the borough. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions on, uh, in particular, on uh, 2325, right to recall? Chair, I don't see any hands raised. Do you have any follow-up questions, additional questions for the panelists? Um, uh, no, I, I, honestly, we, we, could, we, we could talk about this uh, all morning, but um, I, I think that we really, uh, this is not about the debate to the merit of, of this legislation. Clearly, uh, we've demonstrated time and time and again, pre-pandemic over the years, the value of, of experienced workforce and, and what happens uh, when those workers aren't protected, when, when there's either a, a uh, unfortunate pandemic situation like this or when businesses change hands, we've done it and, you know, obviously in, uh, in the service industry, building service industry and, and, and grocery store worker retention. Um, this legislation has worked, it is fair, it is just, and, and so uh, we think certainly that is applicable um, in this instance here, and we look forward to the passage of this legislation. So uh, I do, yep. I was gonna turn it over to public testimony, but you can uh, finish your remarks, Chair Miller. No, yeah, 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 absolutely, yes, you yeah. may. Awesome, thank you. We've concluded administration testimony and we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. After I call your name, a member, this is for the panelists, um, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted. And again, we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before testifying. I, I'm sorry. Um... Mm -hmm. Councilor, be, be, before we, uh, uh, before public testimony, is there others, uh, unions or others that will be testified, will sign signed up to testify? On yes, this? we actually have Robin Roche, who's general counsel, that she'll, she'll be testifying on behalf of DC, DC 37. We also have Jonathan Tubez um, from the Workers Circle, and those are our two public panelists. We have others that have registered, but they are not on yet. So okay. we're going to go to those two first. And then if there are additional registrants that we have not called on, we're going to do that um, and give them an opportunity. Does that sound fair? Excellent. Okay, great. So back to our regular scheduled programming. Um, so the, the panelists, I went through that. Um, council members, if you have questions for a particular panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you raise your hand. Um, so for our first public panel, I would like to now welcome Robin Roche to testify after Robin Roche, we'll be hearing from Jonathan Tubez. Um, Robin Roche, you may begin to testify when the Sergeant at Arms st starts the time, thanks. Time starts now. 
Um, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the New York City Council Civil Service Committee and, and Civil Service and Labor Committee. I am Robin Roach, General Counsel of DC 37. I'm here on behalf of our Executive Director, Henry Guerrero. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to uh, stand in support of intro 2454, um, which, um, as you've heard from um, Stephen Starr, um, who is the ex um, general counsel of the OCB, is in particular addresses concerns with respect to what happened after the, new, the U.S. Supreme Court um, ruled in the Janus matter. And if I may go to our um, testimony, um, District Council 37 is the duly certified collective bargaining representative of some 125,000 public sector employees in the various agencies authorities, boards, and corporations in the city of New York. In addition to these um, public sector employees, we represent another 25,000 employees in the no nonprofit sector. We are here today in support of Intro 2454, uh, which um, has been introduced here. The amendments set forth in intro 2454 would of course bring the New York City collective bargaining law in compliance with the statutory amendments that the New York State Legislature enacted to the Taylor Law in 2018. Of course, the Taylor Law mandates that provisions of the municipal and local collective bargaining laws be in compliance with the Taylor Law itself. Intro uh, Time expired. You may finish. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Intro 2454 addresses several major items in light of the United States Supreme Court's ruling in Janus versus ASME, um, which invalidated, of course, um, statutes and collective bargaining agreements allowing unions to collect agency fees or fair share from non-members without their written consent. Um, for example, um, in this instance, um, except for political and ideological activities, the unions were able to collect these matters that benefit all those in the collective bargaining unit. Um, intro 2454 limits the circumstances under which a union could be held responsible for the breach of duty of fair representation by declining to provide representation to non-members. It would make, it makes clear that the union would not be in breach of the duty of fair representation by not representing a non-member when the employee is being questioned by the employer, nor is the union in breach of duty of the fair representation by declining to represent a non-member in statutory, regulatory, or administrative proceedings, such as due process disciplinary matters pursuant to civil service law, due process appeals of involuntary leaves, actions taken under the Fair Labor Standards Act, finally, Medical Leave Act, federal, state, or local anti-discrimination laws, including the very NYCCBL. We also know that the amendment would not impute a duty of fair representation where the union permits non-members to proceed at their own expense in the grievance arbitration process regarding matters of discipline and performance evaluations only. Here, the non-member would also be responsible for paying the union's share of the cost of such proceedings. Finally, we do not overlook the fact that the amendment allows the unions to provide extra contractual benefits to members only. And we thank you very much for um, allowing us to um, appear before you and give testimony. We look forward to working with you in the passage of this act. Thank you, Robin. Thank you very much, Councilor.
Thank you so much, Robin. We are now gonna to turn to Jonathan Tubes. You may begin. I um, just wanna say that we're gonna actually give um, this public panel, since we have a limited number of registr registrants, we're gonna allow you uh, all to speak for five minutes. So Jonathan, you may begin when the timer starts. Okay, thank you very much. And hopefully I won't even need that long. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, oh, you can start. Okay, thank you so much. And greetings, council members. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a few words. My name is Jonathan Taubis. I live in central Brooklyn and I am the social justice organizer at the Worker Circle. The Worker Circle is a 121 year old Jewish social justice organization. It was formed by Eastern European Jewish immigrants who fled persecution, fled pogroms, and brought with them a stalwart commitment to participatory democracy, the fundamental equality of every person, and bold activism to advance and protect workers' rights in particular. I'm here today as part of a broader coalition supporting the CIW, the Coalition of Amokali Workers, an award-winning human rights organization that works to protect farm workers from abusive conditions in agricultural fields across the East Coast. I'm here to ask that this committee and Chair Miller set a hearing and a vote on Resolution 1156, a resolution calling on Wendy's to join the Fair Food Program and support farm workers' human rights that currently now has 28 co-sponsors and is sitting in this committee. When I was planning to attend this meeting, I was very happy to see the committee would be discussing amendments to the city code in relation to protections for restaurant, food service, airport workers who have all been displaced due to COVID-19. I wanna bring your attention to another group of essential workers that have been drastically impacted by COVID-19, namely the essential farm workers who have also toiled throughout this pandemic to keep food on all of our tables including about 100,000 agricultural workers in the state of New York alone. And this is something that's becoming even more urgent with the emergence of the Omicron variant. Resolution 1156 has already gained monumental support from a broad cross-section of New Yorkers, including, but not limited to, students, religious, political, and financial community leaders. In December 2019, the Women's Caucus wrote a very powerful letter to Wendy's in support of this resolution. Most recently, Former Manhattan Borough President Ruth Messenger penned an op-ed in the Gotham Gazette calling on the city council to quote, act swiftly to send a message to Wendy's about how much New York values human dignity and worth. And when investors representing over $1 trillion in assets managed sent a letter to Wendy's in April of 2021 this year, urging the company to join the fair food program to address quote, the dire consequences of COVID-19 and of systemic racism and to combat widespread abuses in its supply chain, the office of the New York City Comptroller was among those who signed on. So just to wrap up, the time is more urgent than ever. In the coming days, supporters of this resolution will urge its passage through online testimony. Again, the resolution currently has 28 co-sponsors, including a majority of this committee, Council Member Adams, Council Member Dinowitz, Council Member Lewis, Council Member Rosenthal, and Chair Miller are all co-sponsors. My fellow New Yorkers and I are doing our part. We've been making calls, sending emails, showing our support for this resolution and for farm worker rights. Now we ask that the Civil Service and Labor Committee do its part and bring this resolution to a hearing so that we can ensure protections and dignity for all essential workers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will now turn it over to Chair Miller for questions. And thank you so much, Jonathan, and, and, and I assure you that this committee has, for the past eight years, stood with farm workers really uh, leading the charge on, on a resolution that, that quite frankly, um, took a number of years to get passed to be rec for farm workers to be recognized, and, and we understand that that was merely the foundation uh, uh, in making sure that farm workers attain the dignity and respect that they deserve uh, within the workforce, so we'll continue to work with you on that issue. Um, so, uh, Councillor, on uh, 2454, I have a couple of questions, and as well as uh, for Stephen Starb, I, I, I'm glad that uh, Office of Collective Bargaining is, is stands with uh, DC 37 and its other bargaining units uh, 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 in support of 2454. I, I think that one thing that we have espoused to do here at this Committee on Civil Service and Labor, you know, our, our mantra has been that we support the, the right uh, to organize and we support the right to collect the bargaining. Um, what happens after that is, is up to the experts and the pros uh, that sit on, on the other side there. And, and I, I thank you 
uh, for doing the job. Uh, so, to, so the first question is is about, and, and I'm totally a counselor, and, and I know you you guys draw up these questions, and and I just go off script, right? So I'm 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 I'm, I'm gonna deal with with some of my experience and and you know as my time as a president and business agent uh, i did not have to deal with the janice decision that we dealt with in this seat here but certainly we had folks that were uh uh, uh paying agency shop fees and 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 very specific about the benefits that were received or were not received um uh by virtue of the agency shop fee um now that the agency shop fee has disappeared, uh, and, 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 and I know, Council, that, you, that you, you had spoke of in your testimony, some specific benefits that were uh, being received. Um, could, could you, could you uh, explain to the committee um, specifically uh, what that means and what benefits would, they, would a, a non-union member, a non-agency shop fee pay? Uh, be entitled to under the current Janice decision that we are seeking to amend. And, and I'm sorry, and also bring in consistency with the state uh, uh, law um, uh, uh, and the amendments to the Taylor law. So under the uh, under the amendments, uh, a union would still be obligated to uh, bargain and enforce contracts on behalf of members and non-members alike. Mm -hmm. But a union would also be permitted to limit its representation of non-members in disciplinary matters, in statutory hearings, um, and things that do not arise under the contract. Like, for example, a Section 75 civil service uh, disciplinary hearing, a union could decline to represent a non-member uh, in such a hearing, and the non-member would not have uh, the right to charge the union with the violating its duty of fair representation. Uh, a union could also provide uh, non-contractual benefits uh, to its members only. For example, unions will sometimes have um, legal services programs uh, for its members that it funds out of its dues. And so it can decline to provide those same services uh, uh, to non-members because those are not contractual services. Those are services provided by the union itself. And, and, and what about that what about benefits uh, that that may come about through some form of negotiation based on, say for instance, uh, uh, what has uh, taken place over the, uh, maybe that's not a good example, over the past two years and, and uh, obviously the pandemic and, and, and uh, um, work rules and, and other provisions that may have been negotiated outside of the, the standard collective bargaining agreement. Um, Do you mean things like would, overtime? Would well, yeah. I, I, I mean overtime, but you know, there, there may be other compensations uh, involved as well um, that has to do with some, some, um, contractual some wages problems. and benefits. What, like if you're talking about contractual wages and benefits, then those would apply to both members and non-members, and the union, um, you know, would bring grievances to enforce that to the entire bargaining unit. Right now, there, it, 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 there are there are agreements outside standing agreements. Would, would they apply there as well? Like you know, like uh, memorandum of understanding and yeah, yeah, yeah those given, would given apply. The yeah, given the certain special circumstances that that we've seen of late, um, anything, any uh, benefits that has that has derived from those special stand, uh, um, circumstances that that we've seen over the past few years, uh, would that be applicable as well? Yes, uh, those are collective bargaining agreements, like any other. They're just not. Complete um, at the table at the moment. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Um, so, are, are you are you convinced that that 
24, 54 would, would bring uh, the city's workforce into compliance with, with the Taylor Law Amendments uh, of 2018? Yes, I am. Uh, is there anything that you would add uh, that is not uh, a part of this legislation or is, is, is it something that you uh, sat down uh, perhaps with the MLC or DC 37 and, and, and collectively figured out that, that we're, we're in a good space because I would suspect that if DC 37 or some other union within the MLC is legal, legally uh, accountable, that would make the employer legally accountable as well to some degree. So was there some type of a, uh, 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 collaboration on on uh, looking over this legislation. Yes, there was the uh, Office of Collective Bargaining has a history of um, working in collaboration with the MLC and the Office of Labor Relations in uh, developing um, uh, amendments. Uh, we amended our rules in uh, uh, two thousand nine uh, two thousand eighteen. Um, and uh, and in in that situation, we worked with the with OLR and uh, and the MLC, and we did the same here. Um, as an agency, we met um, together with the executive staff, and then um, and then we met uh, collabor and collaborated with both the MLC and OLR in uh, coming up with the amendments that uh, you have before you today. And um, I think I speak with, for all uh, three of us uh, in saying that we think that the amendments that we've come up with address um, the issues that uh, that we need to in, in with respect to the Janus decision and the Taylor Law amendments. Thank you so much. And, 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 and Councillor Roach, um, could you speak specifically to the number of members uh, that were lost um, throughout the district council um, because of the Janice decision? Do you have a specific number? Uh, well, 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 Mr. Chairman, I can. Um, with regard to that, in June 2018, when the Supreme Court decision came down, we had in our records um, some 7,000 or so agency fee shop payers. So that was an, an immediate uh, hit to um, the union on that day, that, that fateful day. Right. Um, so that that's the number, but we had worked very much to reduce that number. Um, of course, with new employees coming in, uh, right. we do not get, the, if we don't get the opportunity to address those employees, they're not able to be resigned. So, you know, it fluctuates. But I can tell you on that very day, it was around 7,000. So I, I would suspect that during, obviously, uh, COVID, uh, the normal uh, introduction, uh, the the normal uh, new member orientation process does not occur. Uh, I, so how 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 does the union then um, coordinate um, with the new member and 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 really have an opportunity to espouse the virtues of belonging to the district council and belonging to a union? So in 2018, uh, the legislature also included a provision that required employers to immediately um, notify the union of new employees that are coming on board. And yes, the onboarding process during COVID-19 has been difficult. However, we've had uh, successes at the larger agencies where they're able to coordinate um, matters or coordinate the onboarding of employees and have been given the union the opportunity to orient uh, employees as to the benefits of uh, joining the union. Um, it is at the smaller agencies where there have been difficulties and there are quite a number of them. And of course, um, we're not 
percent uh, successful at the larger agencies where uh, employee or orientation is more structured. Mm -hmm. So we've had that opportunity. And I also want to mention that we were able to, um, in collective bargaining, address that as well. So we have kind of the belt and suspenders model here, uh, the, the, the law. Uh, in the civil service law, as well as in our own uh, collective bargaining agreement, where the em employer um, has agreed to provide us with information in in a certain in a more timely fashion than it did prior. Uh, that, that, that's good. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that the, the admin at the city sees the value in the organized workforce. Um, have 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 those members that have not uh, joined the union and, and those who perhaps uh, were a part of the union that are no longer uh, dues paying members of the union, ha has that had an impact on, on the diminishment of, of, of benefits? Or, and let's say when you uh, um, are in negotiations at, at whatever level, whether it's the city, whether it's a benefit provider or, or whatever, um, do you take into account uh, services delivered for, for each member. Obviously, in this case, um, uh, they, are, they are included in, in doing so, but is there a way where, uh, during collective bargaining um, and, and, and the regular benefit package, but is there a way to uh, uh, quantify um, the exact course um, that is being lost and or is, does that somehow diminish the value of benefits being received or delivered? on behalf of the union because of the loss of, of, of revenue generated uh, through dues collection? Oh, well, of course, there's been a financial um, hit. Um, however, in terms of the munition of benefits provided and our ability, our, our force at the bargaining table, that has not diminished because we are still representing 125,000. Right. That you know, we're still speaking on behalf of 125,000 workers, and we view them as workers, and and people that, if we are able to garner good benefits, we can demonstrate to them the benefit of being in the union. What is the value that the union adds to to um, any given employee? Uh, we have done a number of things, though, uh, Mr. Chairman. We've not stayed flat-footed. We do have, you know, Union Thursdays, for example, where we go out to a particular employer. It could be uh, one of the H and H facilities, mm -hmm. and we announce that we're coming this Thursday. Da da da, and you know, come talk to us. Uh, we have members who brought their friends in. I, 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 re I remember uh, before we left 125 Barclay Street for its um, refurbishment, I, we had brought in some people who were in the administrative titles. And I saw a member walking in like five of his colleagues to say, here, join the union, here what we have to say, here what we do. So we do a lot of that. We do a lot of member surveys. We encourage members, do member to member sign up so that we've been very proactive with that. And it's been very beneficial, especially when we put the pedal to the metal. Of course, it's been um, affected um, by COVID-19 and our ability to move around, but nevertheless, we are making strides. Have you, have you, I, 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 from, from, from a council uh, committee standpoint, we've seen uh, the growth in, at least in the interest of unions and, or, and, and, and organizing over the past two years, considering uh, the pandemic and, and 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 some of the treatment to to the workforce that that folks found it imperative that they uh, organize and and become a union member to to guarantee uh, some of the benefits that that they weren't enjoying. Um, was there a benefit? Uh, uh, was there an increase uh, in at least interest uh, over the past two years by virtue of COVID nineteen? Um, I. 
couldn't necessarily say that there's been an interest. I, I would say that where we have had the opportunity to speak to people because they don't know. And even with a lot of the people who came off of the payroll as agency fee shop, they were unaware what that meant. That mm. it, for a lot of people it was, it says union, they don't know A means agency right. fee or zero means you're a member. They didn't right. know the difference. But when spoken to uh, by our, 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 our um, address by the union, the, you know, people, their interest was, you know, keen. Uh, we did have, we do have people who are interested in being a part of this, this organization called the union. Okay, and 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 obviously specifically th th this address issues like uh, uh, arbitration, uh, um, representation, and and otherwise. Obviously, that's a significant cost uh, in legal services. Um, could you speak to how how this impacts that uh, um, in terms of having to represent or not represent, non represent? non-represented members uh, during these procedures? Well, as Council Start I explained, um, for negotiated benefits, um, the union owes a duty of fair representation to members, non-members alike. Um, this particular legislation um, would give them, non-members, um, a benefit or um, looking at it, it gives them a little leg up in the sense that if the unions, not necessarily District Council 37, uh, because we do have a very robust way of how we uh, determine whether a case is meritorious and should go to arbitration. And it isn't because of money. It is really the way we view it. We negotiated this contract and we look at it that every bad decision takes away from the meaning of the language in the contract. And every good decision heightens or strengthens the language in the contract. So uh -huh. this is where we believe in the exclusivity of the union and our ability to determine whether something, so whether an, a matter should proceed to arbitration. But as he explained, there it's really only two finite areas, areas of, uh, in collective bargaining that is carved out that would give a lot of leeway to um, a non-member. And that is if in the disciplinary grievance process, uh, which by the way, right now, any member of the bargaining unit could go from steps one through three, which are the intermediate steps before you get to arbitration, the ultimate step, mm -hmm. without the union. However, we have a right to be present during those proceedings and to um, give our take on what the contract says and protect our interests. These two positions that I'm talking about are in disciplinary matters where an individual would have more at stake, let's face it, and evaluation process where the individual again has a lot more at stake than say the union would in, in such matters. And so I, I believe that this legislation looks at it in a fair manner, fair to the union and fair to the employee. Okay, thank you. And 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 that would be for, for, for my colleagues and you know and, and, and some of the lay folks in the audience that that per, per, perhaps uh, were saying that where it would have unintended and uh, consequences. On the on the larger bargaining unit uh, that that the union deems it necessary for them to participate um, in the proceedings uh, because the decision could have dire consequences one way or the other. Want to make sure that it uh, that their resources are behind it to make sure that it has a positive uh, influence. Would, would would that be a situation? Uh, kind of not necessarily at Al, but a, 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 it's something that is not just, it, 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 it may be about the individual, but the consequences are far greater. The decision could be far greater than the individual with the, the union then uh, find its way involved in uh, that process as well. Uh, yeah, that, that is true, Mr. Chairman. We, we would, um, of course, um, again, 
protecting the contract, um, be involved in any kind of process. But more, more than likely, uh, this particular union does review a, a matter to determine whether it should uh, proceed to arbitration or not. And we're, we don't believe that this, this provision requires us to give up our exclusivity. Ah, uh, that, that's important. Thank you. Um, the, the colleagues, I, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, Bianca, could you yep, double check? Yeah, I got it. I got this spiel. Thank you so much, everyone, for your testimony in the first public panel. We're going to turn it over to council member questions. Um, I will now ask if there are any more questions from council members. As a reminder, if council members have questions for a particular panelist, please use the raise hand function in Zoom at this time. Okay, let me see. I don't see any. Okay, seeing as there are no questions, we're I'm now going to turn to our second public panel. Oh, Stephen Starr, uh, do you have a question? Yes. Okay, sure. Not, not a question. I just wanted to um, make a point about um, a non-member's right to proceed to arbitration or or through a grievance. Um, in our view, we don't think that this legislation gives them any greater rights than anyone else. Um, in order for a non-member to proceed to arbitration, uh, that the individual would need the permission of the union. And if the union did not give them that permission, then they could not proceed to arbitration on their own. Um, the outcome in that sense is if the union declined to proceed to arbitration, that person could bring a duty of fair representation case against the union like any member. But um, but the person could not go to arbitration unless the union permitted them to do it. And so um, so in our view, this doesn't give them any greater rights than any of the existing members. And and and, and for you or uh, Councillor Roach, if 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 that non-member proceeded to arbitration, who would incur the cost? Well, um, we. I think if a member, or I'm sorry, a non-member wanted to proceed to arbitration and bear his or her own cost. For example, we have cases where a member would, where we assign, the union assigns counsel to a matter. Just about any case that goes to arbitration for us, counsel is assigned to represent the union because the party is the union. If we were to, uh, designate or to assign uh, our interest in a matter to a non-member, that non-member, this legislation allows the union to um, have the non-member bear the cost of such, of such an arbitration. That's correct. Yes. If the union elects to proceed, then the union can pay for it. If the union uh, gives the member the ability to proceed on their own, then the member would pay for it. Okay, thank you. I'm, and and I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, that labor and management are, are working cohesively on this important issue because clearly there's a lot to uh, agree to disagree about, but this is certainly not one of them that, you know, a strong organized workforce is, is to the benefit of the city. We, we normally preface it every um, hearing that we do here in, in civil service and labor by saying that it is, it is not the members of the city council, the mayor, speaker, or any of the elected officials that, that uh, causes the 65 million uh, tourists to come to New York City, but it is the New York City's valuable workforce that keep us healthy, safe, clean, and all of those things that the, the New York City workforce does uh, uh, that gives value to this city. So I want to thank you both uh, for your testimony um, and, uh, and, and ask that you hang around because we do have uh, another panel and some other questions coming up. Are there any other questions, uh, Bianca? Uh, otherwise, I see uh, the great Susie Lozada. And, and others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Unite 100 members are here strong on the second panel. Um, I don't see any more council member questions. Um, 
So we're going to just move on to the second public panel, if that's okay with you, Chair. Absolutely. Okay. I would like to now welcome Susie Lozada to testify. After Susie, I will be calling on Maria Vermindi. And then John, John, I'm going to apologize in advance. If you want to just uh, give us the pronunciation of your name, I really am going to botch this. So John, can you just uh, pronounce your name for me? Uh, Papa Liberius. Okay, oh, Papa Liberius. Papa Liberius. Awesome. Thanks so much. That's, that's why. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, okay, Susie, you may begin. Starting time. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, Committee of Service, uh, Civil Service and Labor Chair, Danny Miller, and all the city council members. Um, my name is Susie Rosada, and I'm the Secretary Treasurer for Unite Here Local 100, New York Food Service Workers Union. I'm excited to be here today. With the backing of food service workers across New York City to testify in support of Intro 2325. More than anything, COVID 19 has brought home for each of us the sanctity of life and our collective. Responsibility for one another. Working need this bill because the pandemic had kept them out of work for longer than most of us had predicted, predicting this. Many have already faced or will soon face declines on the rise to be recalled to their jobs. With the rise of the recent Omicron, if I'm pronouncing right, variants of COVID-19, it seems that the recovery will continue at a slow and uncertain pace. So we are not sure what will be happening. As a city, we need to reevaluate what is fair and just recovery look like. We must join over a dozen cities across the country that have already passed hospitality worker recall legislation. Since at the start of the pandemic, such bills have passed in Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington DC, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New Haven, among others. We call for the passages of Intro 2325 and an expansion of recall rights to include all food service workers in New York City. The reason is simple. Food service workers must be able to return to their job when those jobs return. This is basically an essential protection for thousands of workers most of whom are black and brown New Yorkers, and the majority of whom are women. United Here Local 100 members believe that racial justice is at the heart of this issue. At a national level, workers of color face higher rates of unemployment than white workers. Black workers are twice as likely to be unemployed as white workers. And Latino workers are about one and a half time as likely New York is. They stay with the higher rates of unemployment for AAPI populations at 7.9% and Latino populations at 10.7%. Working in the hospitality industry have by far faces the most job loss as any sector. Women and people of color in hospitality job tend to face occupational segregation that keeps them in serving positions rather than management of financial jobs in the industry. 
this in-person food service position represent two thirds of pre-pandemic hospitality jobs, but nearly three quarter of jobs lost during the pandemic. Lost wages, lost our workers, larger women and people of color has been and continue to be hit by horrors in this difficult time. In person and food service, has been slow to return and many people continue to work from home. Time expired. Most of the workers cannot work from home. We made sure we do not allow the pandemic to move us backwards and to degrade so much of our hard won progress. Please support intro 2325. He will help us to move forward as we continue to recover from the pandemic and continue to struggle for the justice we all deserve. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. Susan. Thank you so much. I'm gonna now turn it over to Maria. Maria, you may begin when the clock starts. Starting time. Hello, my name is Maria Beramendi. I work at the 20 Watt Club on Fifth Avenue in New York City. I've been with the 20 Watt Club for 11 years. I'm also the first woman who was hired as a banquet captain at the 21 Club. That pandemic affected me a thousand percent. I used to be able to budget my funds properly. This has not only affected me, but my younger daughter also. I used to be able to pay for her after school programs. My daughter is 12 and I want I want to do my best to keep her out of the trouble and have her in programs after school. Currently, me and my daughter lost our benefits due to the 21 being closed. I'm doing the best that I can as a mother. I'm not receiving food stamp or unemployment. I'm, sorry. I'm working as much as I can and still is not enough. My bills are more than $700. I can't afford to live where I'm staying anymore, but I also can't afford to move because I will need three months worth of rent. All the money I save up is gone due to, the, due to the pandemic. I work three jobs right now. I work for the UBS Arena in Long Island. I work for the in job agency. Then often send me to New Jersey. I'm also work at the RHC in New York. I travel between two or three hours to get to work. Working three jobs is simple, still enough. None of these jobs offer benefits that was Benefits that that's why they only give me two days. One yam should be enough. And when the 21 opens, I deserve to go back to work like I never left. Please pass this bill so me and my co-workers who also been there a long time go back to work. We just want peace of mind that we have our job back when they open. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. We're gonna now turn to John. John, you may begin when the clock starts. Starting time. You can start, John. Hi, my name is uh, John Papalberios. Good morning. I'm a, I'm a rest, I'm in the restaurant business for 53 years, and a member of uh, Unite Here Local 100 from the start. The last 29 years working at 21 was a highlight of my career, and the place I want to stay until I finally retire. It was my dream job, my final destination. I, de I, de man I developed many friendships through the year with the customers. They still contact me even today after almost two years out of work. It meant everything to me. The restaurant shut down on March 14th, 2020. I worked the final Saturday night I even served the last party in the dining room. I felt destroyed after spending almost 30 years of my, of my career, of my life at 21 Club. And all my co-workers are suffering. Our medical insurance expired in September. The COBRA plan expired for, through the, the rescue plan. Uh, people are, feeling, are filing for Medicaid and looking for part-time jobs. Personally, I'm a recovering cancer patient 
me and my wife, I'm in remission for the last four years and my insurance ran out in September. I'm, I'm without insurance right now. Unfortunately, this bill does not include the restaurants in the recall plans. We ask you to please include all the restaurants in the recall rights. It was the hardest hit industry during the pandemic and it puzzles me why they left them out. We want to be back to work. Please say yes to intro 2325. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I'm gonna now turn it over to Chair Miller for questions uh, for the panelists. Chair Miller. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, to those that have testified uh, here this morning. Um, uh, Susie, uh, do you know how, how many union members uh, in airport hospitality and service workers uh, were out? How many, re re by virtue of the pandemic, how many remain out today um, that have not gone back to work? So, um... As you know, we represent New York and New Jersey. Uh, we represent 18,000, approximately 18,000 workers. And right now we have uh, 6,000 plus uh, members working. Uh, in our industry, we have an especially restaurant and food service in New York City area, 8,000 plus workers. Um, used to to work in the area, and right now uh, it's only six thousand. Okay. But the thing is that we have restaurants that are open. We have locations that are open, but locations are not open at full capacity, and our members are highly concerned and not to be recalled back to work. So uh, are you saying that that some restaurants have opened in full capacity and, and they have not brought your members back? They may have, in some cases, brought back uh, uh, new workers that are not uh, organized and or uh, who, who uh, quite frankly cost less? No, I'm not saying that. I think the circumstances right now with COVID-19 uh, have not been permitting uh, restaurants and companies to call all the workers. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. what we see is that the few workers that they have called has been doing one, a, the job for one or two people. Of course, yeah. Yeah, so, so um, in your estimation, uh, should they have uh, called back more than the amount of persons that they have called back based on the requirements of the job, not just the fact that historically, as you said, that this may be a job or a task performed by multiple persons, more than one persons, uh, uh, but from a health and safety standpoint, uh, specifically, um, do you believe that uh, they should have and can uh, I have the ability, capacity uh, to call back more folk. I certainly believe it. Um, I think that all the year of experience of our members will be very valuable for the companies. So we have members that have been uh, at work for 20, 10, 10, 20, even 30 years. Um, I understand the circumstances and that's why we're saying as soon the locations are open, they to recall the members. So, and we, we need security for our members, right? Uh, we need the workers who really keep the economy going in New York City to have the opportunity to return to work when uh, the locations are open at full capacity or at the, at the time that they're being opening. Well, you, you heard testimony from the administration about all the work that they have done on behalf of small business, in particular, the restaurant uh, and, uh, uh, and other tourist industries here in, in uh, New York City uh, to support them in a plethora of different ways. 
Um, do you believe that that that, that has been sufficient? Uh, that there is more that the admin can do, or partially is is you know are, are folks kind of reaping the benefits of of all of the governmental uh, support and services, and not necessarily reopening fully, and not necessarily supporting workers in the manner that they were supported. So what I believe is the, the administration has been doing uh, a good job in terms of helping to move the economy in New York City and that the administration is taking a step in supporting in some way uh, the workers uh, through supporting this um, intro 23-25. And I'm sure that all the city council members who are part of the labor committee and the whole city council understand this because we time to time go to restaurant and these are our neighbors and these this workers are the ones that bring up the economy in our neighborhood. So the money that they earn, they are spending within our neighborhood, within the district that city council members represent. Agree, agreed. Um, are there any uh, counselor? Are there any questions uh, from the uh, committee members? I do not see any um, hands raised, but I will remind council members if you have questions for a particular panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, seeing as there are no questions, we are now concluding um, our second panel of testimony. Uh, do you have any further questions for the panelist chair before we move on? Uh, no, I, but Mr. Where is Mr. Papa, Par, pa, Papa, Popular Parrot, Popular Parrot. Yes. I, I <laughs> see, I, I just wanted to say, because I knew I was going to get it right, Popular Parrot, right? So, um, you said that you spent more than 21 years at, 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 at uh, 21? 29 years. 20, 29 years. Wow. That, that's yeah. an, 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 an entire career. Uh, that that folk, most folks would help to have. Uh, and, I don't think three years. <laughs> and, and wow, more than more than half of your more, uh, significantly more than the half of your yeah. adult life, uh, your life. Um, and 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 so you, all of your um, your, your benefits uh, have expired to this point here, including health care, yes. uh, unemployment insurance. Yes. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, we haven't received we haven't received a penny from uh, twenty one club management at all. We haven't received any help at all whatsoever. Not not nothing from the from from the employer at all. So no. all your benefits came from the government. Um, yes, from the rescue plan. Yeah, and and you obviously uh, you, you talked about your health insurance, um, which is expired. Uh, uh, I'm a, a recovery, uh, recovered uh, cancer in your mission right now. So, and, and me you, and my I, wife also. I, you know, I use both. a Cobra now? Cobra? No, oh, it's Cobra uh, expired no. as well. It's expired, yeah. Expired. That was uh, additional September six months? 30th. September 30th. And, and what are your next steps in terms? Obviously, you need health insurance. Yes. <laughs> I was I was hoping that the would call back at work, you know. Yeah, uh, but because you have these pre-existing conditions and and obviously find yourself particularly vulnerable during the pandemics, um, you know, yeah. we we have to make sure that 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 you have health insurance. You yeah. know, that's important. Obviously, the city uh, has, has, has d really done his due diligence in, in making sure that we are providing, uh, health insurance to those, uh, who, who are most vulnerable, those who, uh, who need it most. So, um, uh, offline, I I'm sure whether it's, it's your member or my office can assist that and can assist you there, uh, as well. So, uh, please Appreciate keep that in you. mind you know, that, that we can reach out as, as well. Um, I, I wanna... that's, how, that's how important it is uh, for us, you know, for the, for the intro 2325 to pass, you know, because yes. it's, affect, it's affecting uh, all the members uh, 
a lot of the members are filing for Medicaid and are looking for part-time jobs. And I'm looking for, I'm trying to work part-time jobs to, yeah. you know, to pay for the bills, you know. Absolutely. So it's very important to us uh, for, for the plan to, to go through, you know, because the restaurants are most affected uh, by the, in the industry by any other industry, you know, during the pandemic. It was the hardest hit industry. Uh, absolutely. So it's very extremely important for us for this so, law to pass. The question is: Is your your restaurant is is not open at all? Has it? No, no, they haven't reopened. Okay, uh, they never reopened in any the level, you know, uh, the twenty five percent, the seventy five percent, they never opened. Yeah, do do we do we know uh, from the union perspective if they have any intent to reopen, and and what would be the process in terms of the union? Do you have a, a uh, employment role? based on seniority or whatever, that you can send them to some other uh, restaurants? They haven't, we, responded to, we are, they haven't responded to us at all. Yeah. So we, we are not uh, sure when they will be opening. That's why we don't know when the rest of the restaurant will be opening. That's why we're saying at mm -hmm. the time that the restaurants and the different company open they should recall the workers. Agreed. Uh, agreed. So we, we have to figure out who gets back to work. And and in the interim, so is, is, is the procedure of uh, those, whatever company you were working with, you, you go back there. If there's any new companies come online that come online, is there a procedure for uh, displaced workers within the union to to man those new positions? Well, remember that we passed the uh, worker retention uh, ah, in 2015. Uh, that will apply, but in this situation, which is a recall right due to the pandemic, right. it's a little different because by bargaining, yes, we have uh, one year, six months in some places, three months in other places by bargaining, at, to write to recall, right? right? But pandemic is over a year. <laughs> yeah. And that's why we need to have some security for the workers that go beyond um, bargaining. Okay. Which is we're trying to, to bargain with different companies, which some of them we got some extensions. Uh, but the majority cannot. Uh, Susie, uh, do you work, represent workers in the airport industry? Any workers in the airport industry? Uh, yes, do. we represent uh, the concession workers at the airport, and we also represent the uh, airline catering workers. Uh -huh. uh, yes. Have they returned to work? They have been slowly returning to work. They are not all at full capacity. Um, some other line catering have a big number back to work. And some other line catering uh, has been rehiding the workers as new because uh, based on bargaining, they have only 30 or 60 days. Uh -huh. uh, so that's why it's, again, really important that into 23, 25 pass. So industries such as the airport and airline industry that has significantly benefited from government dollars have, have mm -hmm. not necessarily uh, uh, done right by workers. And, and it is important that uh, this legislation supports workers um, and getting back to work because industry in some cases aren't doing the right thing. Uh, thank you, Susie. Thank you, John. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. We have Chandler, another. Panel. I'm now going to um, make an announcement. Uh, specifically, I'm going to call on Joel Herrera. Joel, I'm not sure if you had registered to give testimony, and if you would like to now, um, you can. I'm going to allow you to talk if you want to let us know if you want to provide testimony. Can you unmute yourself? Um, okay, I guess Joel does not want to give testimony. All right, 
Um, if I have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called on, please use the Zoom raise hand function now and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. So Joelle, if you want to give testimony, please use the raise hand function. If you don't raise your hand, then I'm assuming you don't want to give testimony. All right. Assuming there is no more testimony, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chair Miller for closing remarks. Chair Miller. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bianca. I want to thank the members of the committee for their indulgence in this important hearing. Uh, we have worked really hard to ensure that workers are retained, that they get back to work. As we said before, it is the workforce in New York City, whether it is our municipal workforce, or it is our private workforce that gives this city value and makes 65 million New York uh, out-of-towners want to come to New York and relocate New York and spend that dollars in New York City because of the work that you do, the value that you add to the city. It's incumbent upon us to ensure that we recognize those critical services that are being delivered by the New York City's workforce and that we support this workforce uh, with uh, whatever resources that we have and that we can within our uh, legal and and uh, uh, and other responsibilities to ensure that we're protecting workers. I hope that we have done so. I look forward to the passage of 23-25 um, and, and certainly uh, 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 my legislation 2454 as well. Uh, excited about supporting workers. I want to thank those who testified uh, from the administration, from the union. I uh, look forward to working with you all uh, in the very short period that time that we have left in this legislation, legislative session and my tenure here. Uh, also, I, I believe that we have one more upcoming hearing. Uh, I want to say that uh, over my uh, eight years as the chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, it has been my honor and ple pleasure and, and privilege um, to sit as chair and support workers. I um, had the, the honor and pleasure of working with many of, of you over those past eight years. And I, I know that you all know that, that uh, our work continues, whether we're sitting here or someone else that the struggle on behalf of workers continue and that I will be here with you. So with that, uh, once again, thank you to the members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor who are here this morning. Thank you all for joining us. And this hearing is now adjourned.